morning. I was, I was feeling the shivers, so it was, uh, I enjoyed that. It was powerful. And, you know, I, I like the interlude sometimes that Victoria does. Um, not, meaning, yeah, not meaning I only like it sometimes, but I, she only does it sometimes. So. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it's just very powerful, right, to just constantly be encouraged in that. I, I, sometimes I want to stand up and say, good morning, aliens, uh, because really the call, and, and Paul nails that in, in one of his letters, saying, you know, we're <coughs> aliens, we're, we're kind of not of this dimension, not of this plane, and we forget that. We, we're so used to being around humans and the way that the world system works, the principles of this world, which we were talking about last week in, in Second Peter, that are actually being burned away. And, and the Lord is making a new heaven and new earth, but that is happening all around us, the new heaven and the new earth. So Jesus, we just invite you here this morning, um, as always. Uh, we know that you're here and you go before us and you're behind us and you're beside us and you never leave us. So we just invite ourselves really to tune in to your uh, grace and your presence in Jesus' name. Is your mic on? Uh, no. Thank you. Test. You know, so this week, um, as so many weeks, and mostly it just happens out of the blue now, I used to go hunting for arguments. Um, just for fun, if I was bored, I'd just drop some bombshell uh, in some Facebook group knowing I would get a retaliation just, you know, just to sharpen my skills if I thought my sword was getting dull a bit and I just kind of dive in there. I don't really do that anymore, but every once in a while, um, Karis made a great post. She's does, doing such a great job on our Facebook page, so I just want to publicly say that to Karis. And, uh, but her one this week stirred up some stuff, and uh, I, I figured it would. She said, because she pre-warned me, should I post this one? Um, I don't know. Can you call up, Ryan? Probably not, hey? Yeah, I okay, put down your banana bread, Ryan. Come on. <laughs> Come on, we're running a slick operation here, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Anyways, such, such a great post that she did, kind of about uh, the end of the world, but kind of a reverse spin on it. And he'll show you once it gets up. Um, but I, so she said, do you think this is okay to put up? I said, oh, yeah, I love it. Like, totally go for it. <laughs> Pretty much you never have to ask. Uh, cause w whatever flack we get, I just, I love dealing with those people. And so, uh, so anyways, I, I started then taking the post she did and reposting it in the seven or eight groups I'm involved in. Now, un unbeknownst to me, I'm involved in this group called Free Grace. Cause you know, I'm always posting stuff. People are always liking it. And so I, I, I thought it was a safe group, you know, Free Grace sounded good, right? Uh, turns out not so much. Uh, they have a different version of free grace, which means elected specific group to only them. Everyone else is going to hell, which didn't sound like free grace to me, but I found out I was in that group. Um, oh, this was another good one that she did too. No, it was the cartoon one. Boy, I got a lot of heat on this one too, though. That was, that was fun. Thanks. Thanks, Karis. There it is. Look at this. Relax, it all happened in 70 AD. And it usually, <laughs> usually it's like it's the end of the world, right? Even uh, the last time Brad and I were in, were in Vegas together for a conference, and there was literally a guy on the sidewalk with a sign and a bullhorn. You know, it's the end of the world. Repent. You're all sinners. God's mad at you. And um, anyway, so this guy had kind of that sentiment, and he he sentiment and he was kind of going at me back and forth and and I it's such a pleasure for me because I've watched how much grace has changed me because I used to get angry and get in there and get in the mud with him and uh, so he's using all sorts of verses and and I'm saying I really don't know what you're talking about and so in the end he said to me yeah I just feel the spirit nudging me not to argue and he quoted like Matthew thirteen three, and so I had to look it up um so I look it up, and sure enough, it is that, um, you know, the angels were told by the Lord, let the wheat and the tares grow up together, and then in the end, we will cut them all down and burn the tares in the fire. And, uh, and so I said to him, 
yeah, it always goes this way. You know, in the end, it's always, you don't agree with me, so you're burning in hell. And I said, I didn't realize that my view of eschatology, which is this, end times, was a precursor to salvation. And it isn't in any of the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. It isn't you have to believe in my particular version of the end of the world because it's only a theory, right? We don't know what's going to happen. And as a result of that, if you don't believe their particular brand, you're guilty of hellfire and brimstone. So cheekily, I said to him, I am sure that a spirit did nudge you to say that. I said, I'm just not convinced it was the Holy Spirit who nudged you to say something like that. And then I said, I'm out, and I blocked him, so. (laughs) Well, we can't slam phones down anymore, so I can hit block on Facebook, yeah. No, because I'm just no longer interested in my life of having those arguments. If I think somebody's winnable and reachable, as was another guy, we went back and forth, and, and he was starting to see my point of view, and I was starting to see his point of view, and we were having a very good discussion. But what so often amazes me is that There is such a correlation between hell and wrath and punishment and end times. It's like a doggy bag that all goes together perfectly, right? It's the same vomit that all fits together in the little vomit bag. And And I said to him, you know, buddy, the problem is I used to believe what you believe. You're not going to teach me anything new. I used to teach what you're teaching. I used to defend what you're defending. I used to believe what you believe. So nothing is new. I've just found a God that is more gracious and more compassionate. What really upset him is, he said, the ridiculous notion that the kingdom of God has come. And there are many, many people that feel that way. Many people in the church feel that it is absolute heresy and apostasy to suggest that the kingdom of Jesus has come. But I want you to take a moment and think about that. If the kingdom of Jesus had not come, and it is not presently working and growing in our world, Jesus described the kingdom of God like a mustard seed that would go in the ground, and it would have to go in the ground, die, and then it produces fruit. And that mustard seed begins to grow wild and take over the garden. He said it's like a piece of yeast that goes into the dough, and eventually it works itself through the whole batch. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of the earth, because they said, well, where is it? Where is the kingdom? They said, this is a ridiculous notion. The guy said to me, how is it that you can get, you know, get it? The kingdom of God, he said, doesn't come to anybody. It's something you get into. So I quoted three verses where Jesus said, and the kingdom of God has come to you. (laughs) Three times. Jesus said, if you've experienced this, the kingdom of God has come to you. When he cast out demons and they experienced the deliverance from demonic oppression, he said, the kingdom of God has come near you. I said, the kingdom of God is not a place. The, ki- the kingdom of God is, is a presence. It, it is a thing. I said, because he was talking about church planting in the kingdom. I said, church planting, he goes, well, it's so ridiculous. How can you plant a church in the kingdom? I said, you can't plant a church in the kingdom. The church is the kingdom. You can't plant it in it. That is what the kingdom is. But people have this idea that the kingdom is heaven. It's like a palace, a mothership, a space cube that's going to descend. We talked about that, the 1,500-mile space cube that's coming. Lots of video on the Internet where you can actually get pre-renderings of the space cube. Book your tickets now. You might want a room with a view, you know, however you pick a floor. It's it, like you don't want to be on one of those top floors because, the ele- I mean, maybe it's speed of light elevators, I mean, new tech. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but... But really, I mean, this is the literal view that people come to Scripture with. And it's because of our Western mindset. We want to put it in a test tube and prove it. But that's why Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this dimension. You can't get in it. You can't ride an elevator in it. It's not a place where you go. It's not about rubies and diamonds and big fat crowns. I remember growing up that way. Just oh, I know, sorry. I should have slowly worked into that one for some of you. Some of you have been really counting on those crowns. (laughs) You see, it's what a crown brings. What does a crown bring? Well, a king wears a crown because it shows he has authority. It shows that he has position. He has confidence. He is full of royalty. It shows that he is set apart, that what he says matters, that he can decree things and say things, and they happen because he says so. This is the crown that Jesus has called you to wear. 
wasn't a physical crown. I'm not shining it up. The more good works you do, the shinier it is. I know I, I joked about this the other week forever. It's just so good. I want to go back there, you know, <laughs> over and over. 39 minutes. <laughs> 39 minutes. <laughs> Clock's ticking. You know, it's not about that, but, but it's that, and my dad made a good point the other week. He said, you know, this is the problem with so many Christians. They're walking around with our heads down, filled with guilt and shame and condemnation. But if you've got a crown on your head and you're always walking like this, what happens? Your crown falls off. So lots of us are walking around with our crowns off because we're not walking upright and boldly coming before the throne of grace as if the crown belongs to you. The crown does belong to you. You know, what's interesting is that we always want to make it about works and what we do. And this is how I grew up. It's like the more works you did, the more people you led to Jesus, it's another notch in the belt, another reward. And, you know, it's all about building up those rewards. You know, and then we would use those verses. Well, Scripture says that. Do not store your treasure here on earth, but store your treasure up in heaven. So we would think, well, if I'm leading people to Christ and ha- you know, committing to my church and getting involved in a weekly Bible study, you know, I'm, I'm chalking up those treasures in heaven so that when I get there, I can just roll around in all my money and my, my coins and you know, try on different crowns and li- scepters. and uh, No one needs that stuff. It kind of reminds me of a new TV series out um, called uh, The Last Man on Earth or something like that. It's pretty funny. There's a virus has come and killed everyone, and, and, and he's the last guy. So he's just doing crazy things, like he's just driving a Winnebago around. He finds a tank. He's just driving tanks up and down the street, right into shopping malls. He's playing golf in the White House. I mean, he's just, you know, just like he's just doing whatever he wants. And the one shot, he's, he's practicing his golf swing in-house and, you know, rips it through a painting, and he runs over, he's like, oh, he goes, at least it wasn't a Monet, and then he goes, oh, no, it was, you know, and it's <laughs> wrecked it, but, you know, and they find big piles of cash everywhere, you know, and they've got tons of money, but it, it doesn't matter anymore. It has no value, because who cares if you've got a lot of money? You're the last guy on earth. You don't need money anymore, and this is why the reward system in heaven, we, if you really think about it, it's not a great motivating factor, because if we all have crowns, the crowns aren't very valuable. You know, eventually you'll, you'll lose your crown. Oh, it's okay. I got a thousand more in the shed. You know, just pile them up. I did lots of good stuff. But you can have one if you want. I heard you didn't do that much good stuff, you know. You know, you, d- you just drank coffee at church. You didn't help make it. So, you know, you can have one of my crowns. I made coffee all the time. I got a whole pile of these things. You know, I don't really need them. You know, say what? <laughs> you know, so what's the point of that? It's not really a motivating factor, but yet we all act as if somehow we've earned it and we have it. Again, it reminded me of this image in the show while we're worshiping. I I don't know why these things happen. We're in the middle of worshiping, and I'm thinking about this this show where they're fighting over bacon. And because they're getting down to their food supplies, he eventually finds a few more people, and, and they're running low on food supplies. And one of them, one of the guys, he finds a whole freezer of bacon that's a good find when there's no bacon left right now he's holding on to that with all his might he doesn't want to share he don't want because that's his and i find that growing up in the circles i did we we treated that like salvation it was our bacon you know we found jesus too bad for you and the more the elect group the more it is too bad for you this is my bacon i get a crown i get jewels jesus loves me I, I believed in him. I sacrificed. You guys know I've joked about it before. I was talking to this young guy one time about the subject of hell, and he said, well, if no one's going to hell, what's the point? What's the point of Jesus? You know how hard I've worked? I'm like, wow, I think you've missed the point of salvation. If you really, He goes, do you know what I've given up? I'm like, you've given up hell. You've given up a life of hell to get a life of liberty. But when you always project it to the end, that the reward's at the end, that it's heaven or hell at the end, then Jesus isn't applicable for right now. He isn't here to take away our anxieties and our depression and our stress and our worries and our fears and our guilt and our condemnation. Jesus is good for later life, after life. So when I was thinking about this, this bacon analogy, 
You know, it's a funny thing because he finally just feels so guilty and bad and just starts hating himself because he's not sharing the bacon. So when he finally tells everyone that he's been eating bacon and he's already like consumed half the freezer of it, imagine their reaction. What do you think your reaction would be? <coughs> You're like, hey, no problem, buddy. You know, it's like. <laughs> but how upset are you going to be? He already ate half the bacon. There's not very much left for everyone. You know, and I, I started to think, what, what is the rest of the world going to be like when they find out we've been hoarding Jesus? You know, they haven't been given the same opportunity as we. It's, it's almost like we're hoarding the bacon. Now, of course, the response is, oh, yes, but these people know about the bacon. They know about Jesus. They have access to bacon. We've been frying bacon for years. We open up the doors to our bacon centers so the smell gets out. We send out flyers about the bacon. And they've rejected the bacon. So I want you to really think about this analogy. What do we do with the people that reject the bacon? We fry them up too as soon as we run out of bacon. I mean, this is the concept of hell. You reject the bacon, and we fry you up. That's not what would happen in the real world. What happens in the real world if we're all sharing bacon, and there's little bacon left to go around, and Dan comes along and goes, nah, I'm, I'm going vegan. I'm not angry at Dan. I'm not thinking, well, we should burn Dan alive at a stake. That is not the natural inclination. Let's burn Dan. He's rejected almighty bacon. What is actually my real reaction? Oh, that, yeah, great. Great. Do you have any friends that like to go vegan? Because what does it mean? It means I get more bacon. Why isn't this the church's reaction when it comes to Jesus? You don't want Jesus? <laughs> okay, more for me. More Jesus for me. I, I shouldn't want you to be punished. I should just rejoice that if you don't want it, that's fine. I just get to still have my bacon. So it means you don't want any. Vegan means no bacon for you. Yeah, so you're a bacon atheist. That awesome, awesome. You don't even believe the bacon exists even better. You don't even think there's a freezer with the bacon in it. Awesome. There's not. Don't worry about it. Because then I can have it. Oh, I, you know, I don't have to save my seat at church. It's going to always be empty. Why don't we respond that way? Why don't we respond, good, fine, no problem. <coughs> now, out of love, we want to pull them in. But there shouldn't be this gut reaction of wanting to see those people punished. You see, because we know that bacon's good. And then when you find out, when you really start to press, Dan, why is it that you don't want the bacon? I mean, can you not smell it? Can you smell it? Just cut a slice of tomato, put some mayo, like, doesn't it even tempt you? And then as you begin to talk to him, you find out he had a really bad experience with bacon. He had some rotten bacon. If you ever open a pack of bacon, can't cook the whole pack, you leave like three or four strips left, you go, I'll get to that later. A week goes by, you kind of pull it out and it's changing a color you don't fully recognize in the color spectrum. You know, there's some tints in there you're not quite expecting. There's a greenish hue among the bacon. And you go, well, you know, I like it really extra crispy. Maybe I could fry that up anyway. You know, and you kind of pull it out of the, the pack and you, you get a whiff of that and throw it quickly in the pan and think, I better wash my hands. <laughs> but you still proceed to think I could still maybe eat it. Because it kind of can go rancid after a while. But this is the problem that people have experienced bad bacon. They've, they've come into the church and eaten rancid bacon. And go, geez, I was already feeling guilty about sin, and then I came to church. And now I feel horrific. 
Now I not only feel bad about my sin, but I know God's mad about my bad, and he's going to do something about it. So now I've got guilt, shame, condemnation, and fear working together, and it's all on a time limit because the world's about to end. So not only do I got to fix this, but I better get my crap together right now because the clock is ticking, (coughs) and I don't want to get left behind. I want to suggest to you the reason people don't believe in the Lord is they've had a bad experience with God. (coughs) I've yet to meet an atheist that hasn't. Oh, thank you very much. (coughs) I haven't met an atheist that hasn't had some kind of bad experience that led them to not believe in God. And I've said this a lot, but they're never, they're never neutral on the position of God. You bring up God to most agnostics and atheists, and the response is anger. The response isn't neutral, isn't, yeah, no, I just don't believe there's a God. You go, oh, yeah? If there was a God, how come there's so much, what do you hear? Suffering. Suffering. How come there's so much? evil (coughs) how come there's so much pain i think lex luther said it really well in the batman superman movie he said god can exist because if he's good then he's not all powerful because if he was good he'd do something about it and if he is all powerful and he hasn't dealt with evil then he can't be all good this is what he was saying to superman Very true. Atheists use that argument. So what is it? Is it God all good or all powerful? Because if he is all good, he should do something about the evil in the world. But this is why we believe the kingdom of God has come. God did do something about it. He sent his son. And he sent his son to put on display for the entire world that this is what grace and goodness looks like. When your enemies come at you, when they falsely accuse you, when they go to the point of putting you on a cross And saying all manners of evil against you, you say, I forgive you because you don't understand. And God met our violence and our wrath with his grace and his peace. And the weight of that, the weight of that transaction that Jesus put on full display in a dramatic exposure on the cross has forever changed the human race. Because 2,000 years later, you know, we're, we're ending slavery. 2,000 years later, we care about people who are going hungry and not just taking all the bacon for ourselves. We see where there's injustice and wrong things in the world. Everyone now, I mean, there's just videos left, right, and center crying out against big pharmaceutical companies in, in the U.S. Just talking about how criminal, and there's documentary after documentary, how they own the government and how they own all, you know, the, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association are owned by Big Pharma. So do you think we're getting good information? No, they, they want to keep us sick. You know, drugs that are treating high blood pressure make $53 billion a year. They've got a lot of extra money to push their weight around in Congress. But the kingdom of God, as it advances, people start popping up going, that's evil, that's wrong, that can't be, that's not godly, that isn't righteous, that isn't holy. Now, they might not use those words, and they're not carrying a cross, but I'm telling you, that's the kingdom of God. The fact that we see all this goodness permeate our world, finally, it looks like the Americans are changing when it comes to guns. But who's changing it? The governments that are owned by lobbyists? No, corporations. Walmart just said, no, can't buy a gun unless you're 21. Dick Sporting Goods said, whoop, we better do the same thing because we're going to lose customers because that's what customers want. Oh, and by the way, you're going to need a background check. Oh, and by the way, you, you, you're going to need something else to buy bullets. And now the pressure's happening and it's changing. And who's driving that? Young people. The next generation's driving it. They're saying no more, not on our planet. We're not going to have this on our planet anymore. It's not righteous. It's not godly. And it's stupid. So we're not doing that anymore. But this is all kingdom of God. This is kingdom changing. Day by day, step by step. So let's look at some of those verses that we were talking about last week. We always hear this term, (coughs) the end times. 
And for most of my life, I was always scared about the end times. When was the end times? We, we talked about it last week, saying we, we've always lived in fear and so much teaching in North America has been, but it's very young doctrine. Only since the 1960s has this plague of bad teaching been in the North American church. I have a pastor friend who was sometimes in the States. He was from Ireland, and he went back to Ireland and talked to the bishop who trained him up. And his bishop sat him down and very aggressively rebuked him and said, you have come under the deception and the lies of American false teaching when it comes to end times. And you've got to come back to the truth, back to orthodoxy of what the church has always believed, that the kingdom of God is expanding and growing in the earth and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that we have a glorious future. Do you not feel it when we sing these songs? Do you not feel it like you, your soul's opening up and then you go, yes, and here comes the fireballs and asteroids. Is that what you think? Is anybody having that vision? Okay, come up here if you're having that vision. We're gonna pray with you. But you're not having those things. Bodies rolling up on the shore of all God's dead enemies. Is anybody having those visions? No? Hmm. Yeah. But it would be weird, right? It'd be weird as you're singing about the grace and the love and the power of God, never ending, never failing, to have visions of dead bodies. The blood rising up to the bridle of the horses. That's what we were taught. That's what's going to happen in the end. There's going to be so much blood. It's going to come up to the bridle of the horse. That's why every time I go to a farm, I'm checking how high the blood is. <laughs> oh, we're good. It's only a foot. It's ridiculous, right? And we live in fear of that. Now, most of us have just so pushed it back to the mind because we've got bills, we've got kids, we've got relationships to deal with, we've got finances, we've got other concerns than blood raising to the level of the bridle of a horse. But for those of us who've been so indoctrinated, and it goes back, but it's still there haunting you. Is this the end? Ooh, what's North Korea doing? Ooh, ooh. What's Putin doing? Ooh, Putin's got big missiles now. He's putting it on display. Putin's got a deep insecurity problem. That's why he's doing that. <laughs> Not because there's an imminent war. But you know, it's those fear pangs. Oh, is this it? Maybe I've been wrong. But God's leading us to a glorious future. But the problem is when you believe those things back in the back of your mind, they affect you today. Because how do you believe in a hopeful, glorious future when you're entering worship, when all you have is dark images of nuclear holocaust? How many of you, at any time in your life, it'd be good to see this even for the young people, have been, like, viscerally afraid about a nuclear war happening at some point? Raise them high. And, and young people, you can look around, because some of you haven't experienced this. Right? A lot of us did. That fear impacts you. That fear causes you to live a certain way, like there's imminent danger. But let me tell you, we're, we're, we're not under threat of that. That's not where things are going. That's not what God's doing. He's changing the world. He's changing the hearts. And look, he's just used the Olympics, and now North Korea is starting to talk to South Korea. There's been some movement there. Through what? Through sport, through love, through, through desiring peace, through a big spectacle full of LED lights and shows and drones and video screens about peace and love that even crazy, violent people are like, well, that seems nice. <laughs> Maybe everyone hating us isn't as good as I thought. This is why I always laugh when it comes down to when I am arguing with people, I'm like, no, people have to believe. They can't be saved if they don't believe. I said, well, to a degree, yes. If I believe in wrath and guilt and judgment, I'm not saved. I, I live under that. I'm not saved from it if I believe in it. But as far as God's concerned, where do, I said, where do we set that bar? Believe what? How much? How hard? Super believe? How, like, what do you have to believe? How many of you would say, I unequivocally trust God in my life every day? <laughs> oh, 
How many? How are you going to say that? There is never a situation where I don't trust the Lord. Me and God, always trust him because I fully believe. No takers, hey? Aren't most of you filled with the Holy Spirit? Shame. Huh? How much do we believe? Like if we're going to be judged by how well we believe, let's hope the end times aren't going to happen for a while because I still have a ways to go. And if I'm leading this monthly crew, we're in trouble because if I got a ways to go, you probably aren't there yet. That's a scary thing to think I'm going to be judged on what and how well I believe it. And then what is it that we have to believe? Believing and being baptized and filled in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? What if that's wrong? Then I'm kind of off kilter in my belief. But what if the Catholics are right and we should have all been praying to Mary all this time? And we didn't believe that she was really the mother of God in the way that they think. <clears throat> that was the cut. Oh, I could have tossed up a couple prayers. Hail Mary, full of grace. Like, how hard was that? And now hell. Oh, just a couple of Mary prayers. I could have... It's always making jokes about that. It's just so dumb. This fire is hot. Ah! Mary prayers. I should have figured it out. They owned all the buildings. So dumb. You know, which, which is it? Of the 30,000 denominations, which one has nailed it? That if we're going to be judged on our belief, boy, gee, we better get it right. And it's kind of a problem because the book we're following is in English and the translation before that was in Greek and there's a good chance that the translation before that was in Aramaic. Yikes! We've spun two languages over and then we have a mixed group of people from all sorts of different beliefs all trying to translate it and now we're going some of it's even wrong. So just forget the people in the last 2,000 years. They're out. Bad translations. I mean, if we're going to be judged on that, no. But Scripture doesn't say that. It says this. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All. It is why we needed the one man, Jesus Christ, the Savior, who was perfect in faith, perfect in righteousness before God, perfectly believed his Father, knew the love of the Father because the Father's Spirit was through him and in him and abided on him. And he set the way because he believed in us. He believed that through his impartation of wisdom and his Spirit that the human race would change. And so far, he's right. We've been changing. It's getting better it's getting glorious. So how do we know? How do we know? Am I just saying it? The end times? Well, let's, let's, look, at, let's look at Joel 2 quickly. Oh, wow, Joel 2 is super long. I've lost my place. <laughs> um, just give me one second. Okay, there it is. Okay, I'll, I'll lead up to it. Uh, the whole chapter is good. Well, I'll just start verse 1 and I'll flip down. So it says, the day of the Lord. Jesus talked about this, the day of the Lord. We hear about the day of the judgment of God coming, the day of judgment, right? We've heard this, the day of judgment, end times, that it all goes together. Blow the ram's horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. This used to be a song. <laughs> we sang this in church. All the inhabitants of the earth will tremble because of the day of the Lord has come, because it is near. Now, you're, you're going to listen to this, and you're going to start to go, well, that kind of sounds like the book of Revelation. Now, there's a reason it sounds like the book of Revelation, because John is quoting this passage scattered throughout the book of Revelation in his Revelation. So if you don't know this, the book of Revelation quotes the Old Testament more than any New Testament book does. The book of Revelation is just one giant mishmash plagiarism of the Old Testament 
with a couple of other sprinklings. I mean, that, that is the idea of the book. So, so just off the surface, if John is quoting a Jewish Old Testament about prophecies pertaining to the Hebrew people in the Revelation, and the entirety of the book is quoting really old, old books that the Hebrews have only had and followed, then I think we're in a safe camp to say that it's probably about them and things pertaining to them. All the inhabitants of the earth will tremble. And again, if you look up that word in Hebrew, it, the, the idea is tribe, the people of the land, not global. Okay, that, that's what the word means. Again, not great translation. Because it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spreading over the mountain. A great and mighty army comes, such as was never before and never will be again even though the year through the years of all generations before them fire devours and behind them a flame blazes i just have to say this because it was so funny growing in church we'd sing this song blow the trumpet in zion zion sound the alarm on god's holy mountain and we say sound the alarm sound the alarm they run on the city they run on the walls for great is the army that carries out his word now, what we didn't know is we were singing a song about the destruction of Jerusalem. We were cheering on the Romans in church. Come on, Romans! Sound the alarm! They rush on the city, they run on the walls. Hallelujah! For great is the army, and we'd all get out our handkerchiefs. And then the Lord, woo! Burn the city, burn the temple. We had no idea that's what we were singing. No one looked it up. I'm sure there were some old guys in the back going, And then someone just handed him a handkerchief. <laughs> oh, no, no, no it's, it's different in here. We're cheering on Romans. Bloodshed. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> listen to what it says before them fire devours and behind them flames ablaze and the land is like the garden of Eden before them but behind them a desolate wasteland and nothing escapes them they have the appearance of horses and like cavalry they run with the sound of chariots they leap on mountains what surrounds Jerusalem is mountains Consuming stubble, mighty army arrayed for war. Before them, peoples are tormented. Even the face turns pale. Like mighty men, they run. Revelation says, and they will cry out for the mountains to cover them. Eh? Tell you a little interesting piece of information I didn't follow up with you last week. There's a book called the Book of Josephus. It's about this thick. Just about every pastor ha in North America will have that book on a shelf. I have one on mine but none of them are reading it, apparently. Because Josephus, so many scholars will say, well, Revelation was written in 90 AD, far after Jerusalem was destroyed. So if that's true, then the book of Revelation is total plagiarism because he just stole from Josephus, who was a Roman historian who lived and watched and was sitting on a horse when Jerusalem burned to the ground. He was there. The Romans spared his life because he was part of a revolt they killed all his friends, let Josephus live because he was a scribe and a historian, and they made him write the history of the Jewish wars and how Rome defeated them. So Josephus was there on a horse while Jerusalem was burning, and he writes everything that is in the book of Revelation. So there's only one of two options. Either he had a scroll later when he looked at Revelation and was copying it, or John, the apostle, was reading Josephus and just put that in the book of Revelation. Now, what'd be really weird is that John, a Jew, writing the book of Revelation, didn't at any point go, and it's real bummer that they burned down our temple. Like, he probably would have mentioned it, right? You live in Calgary, they burnt the entire city down and were crucifying all the occupants of our city on our buildings downtown, you might mention it in your memoirs. 
It might be something burned in your memory, right? If the whole city was on fire and they were launching people into buildings through catapults, which they did. I'm not making it up. They were launching Jews at the wall. It was horrific. It was a ghastly, ghastly thing that happened. Some of the stuff is so bad, I can't preach on it. I can't even tell you in a public group because it's so disturbingly horrific what they did to people. Like, like worse than what Hitler did. But most people just don't know. No, John is quoting out of the book. Josephus is remembering things out of the book of Revelation. What's interesting is he writes, not a single Christian life was lost during the siege of Jerusalem because all the Christians had escaped to Pella. (coughs) Why do you think all the Christians knew to escape? They had a letter called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, and they went, okay, honey, uh, we're going to need to pack the bags. That's where it says when Jesus said, you know, don't go back for your cloak. Pray that it doesn't happen during the winter. And you know what? It didn't. They attacked during the spring. And they all went and hid in caves and started an underground church movement. You know what's really odd is the majority of Christian writings disappear from about 70 to 150 AD. Gone. What happened to all those people? It's like they were there and they were all gone. And no one knows kind of what happened. They all went into caves, and then there was no trace of them. They just kind of were gone. We don't know. It's weird, though. Do, 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 do. Josephus writes this. Yeah, maybe they did. There's theories that they did. That's a theory that the Perugia happened there. Because what does it say? Jesus said that he would come like what? Like a thief in the night. So not with a trumpet, not with a here I am. That he would come at night, sneakily, and be in and out before anyone notice, right? A thief doesn't come in, hey, I'm going to take your TV. I need it for my crack habit. Thank you. (laughs) Thieves don't do that. They come in, they take what, and they hope you don't hear them. You know what Josephus writes? He said, as they surrounded Jerusalem, they said, had there not been so many eyewitnesses, nobody would have believed that the heavens were opened and they saw giant riders on their horses in the clouds surrounding the city. And Titus, the commander, knew something was up. They heard a loud blast from the temple inside Jerusalem and they all heard an audible voice that said, we are leaving this place. And a great gust of wind happened and the eastern gate opened up on its own. And Titus said, Let's move in. Because they believed back then. They all had their gods, and they said their god has left them, and they invaded the city. This is, this is history. Now, some of you should be having this feeling like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? Why didn't anyone tell us that? That's a pretty big deal. And Jerusalem was destroyed. It's why Jesus said that not one of these stones that you see in the temple will be standing on top of each other, but they will all be torn down. Within days, while the fire was so hot in Jerusalem and the fire was started accidentally. Titus' father, I think Vespasian, was devastated because it was such a relic. They didn't want the temple destroyed, but the fire was so hot, it melted all the gold. And the gold as liquid was going down through between the rocks. So the soldiers, as bounty, were allowed to remove the temple stones to get at their prize. And that is why they removed all the stones except the foundational wall where Jews go today and pilgrims from all the earth that we call the Wailing Wall, and they weep for the destruction of that temple. And Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Almost done. So as Joel goes on, he says, before them, <laughs> says they will climb through the houses, enter the windows like thieves. Before them, the earthquakes, the heavens shook, History tells us that some of the greatest earthquakes that have ever happened in the world happened in the first century. The sun and the moon darken. What does that sound like? Book of Revelation. And the stars withdraw their radiance. The Lord has sounded his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. Mighty is the one who accomplishes his word, for great is the Lord who can endure this time. 
Revelation says it's going to be all these bowls of wrath poured out. Who can endure it? Rend your heart, tear your garments, verse 13. There's mourning, there's crying. Who knows, verse 14, he might turn aside and relent. He might leave behind a blessing, a grain offering, a food offering. Let's scroll all the way down. Uh, it's interesting if verse 21 says, do not be afraid land, exalt and rejoice for the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid beasts of the field because the wild pastures flourish. He's talking about the kingdom of God because the tree bears its fruit. Because while this prophecy has been given to Joel, the spirit of God is saying, write and say, do not be afraid because I have done great things, because Jesus has already died. The resurrection's happened. The seed has gone into the ground and it has died, and now it has risen, and it is starting to bear fruit in the world. And part of that fruit was to collapse an animal sacrificial blood system for the repentance of sin, to bury it along with the law, and say freedom and grace to the nations, to the world, and to all mankind. That was the declaration that this prophecy is talking about. And children of Zion, exalt and rejoice in the Lord your God because he has given to you the earth, the early rain for vindication. Okay, now listen, we'll go to verse 28. It says, and it will be that afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams and your old men will see visions even on the men servants and the maid servants in those days i will pour out my spirit then i will work wonders in the heavens and the earth blood and fire and columns of smoke the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awe inspiring day of the lord comes and it will be that everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved for on mount zion and in jerusalem there will be deliverance and the lord has said and among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So now I want to just go over here and read to you Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is, talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in place, and suddenly a sound like a mighty rushing wind came from heaven and filled the entire house where they're sitting. They began to speak in tongues as a fire being distributed and resting on each of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now it talks about all the nations of the world dwelling in Jerusalem were there. There were Jews and Galileans and Medes and Parthians and Mesopotamians, Cappadocians, uh, Egyptians. They're from all over the world. So the, this is what that prophecy is talking about. And the whole world will be there. Listen to what Peter says. They're all mocking, saying these men are full of new wine. <coughs> but Peter says, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to the men of Judah, or Judea, and all you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. Now they all know the Old Testament. They all know the prophecy of Joel. For these men are not drunk as you suppose since it is the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, says God, that I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapors of smoke, and the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." And Peter is saying that this prophecy is being fulfilled right now. Right now. And the evidence was that women were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the evidence was, shortly after this, Gentiles, oh my goodness, Peter's mind's blown. He walks in and Gentiles are praying in tongues. He's like, whoa, we thought this was just for the Jews. No, because Joel said, I will pour my spirit in the last days on all flesh. And that meant the women and the Gentiles, that everyone could get it. So the evidence 
that they were in the end times was that it was already happening. And what were they doing? They were all prophesying. They're all having words of knowledge. Did Peter have a vision in Acts 2? Yes. Did Peter dream dreams in Acts 2? Yes. Did Paul? Yes. They were all dreaming dreams. It talks about lots of dreams. They're having visions. This is happening. And you've got to think a short time after this, just like 20 years, the Jewish wars begin and the the city begins to burn. And there's fire and blood and smoke. And Josephus writes that the blood that was in the Dead Sea where there's Sea of Galilee came up to the bridle of the horses. That's exact fulfillment. It's an exact fulfillment. And the more you read the Old Testament, I won't go into depth of it because there's so many. I could read you chapter after chapter after chapter in the Old Testament that mimics the exact same thing that I just read to you now. <coughs> These were the end days. You always have to ask when you talk to other believers, what do you mean when you say the end days? The end days of what? The end of what? The end of human civilization? No, the Bible never talks about that. It's the end of an old covenant. Like, shouldn't it have been a big deal, don't you think? Ending thousands of years of killing people for sacrifice for forgiveness of sin, and then it graduated to animals, and then God said, how about you do doves and grain? Like, do you not see that as a weaning system? 10,000 virgins. Hmm, maybe, maybe we'll do cattle, right? So we started doing cattle, and we're like, cattle are big, and it's messy, and it's too much blood. We'll do sheep. The sheep are like, oh, really? Right? And then we go to goats, right? And then we start going to doves, into grain offerings, and then God said, how about just a wave offering? That's what we do in worship. A wave offering, a handkerchief offering, right? And then Jesus becomes the once and for all offering. So this should be climactic. That should have had, and and I want you to see the physical change that as the kingdom of God came to the earth, there was literally earthquakes. It shook the earth. Paul and Silas in the prison, as Paul begins to worship, what happens? An earthquake. Because that had never happened before in the history of mankind. That men, engorged with the Spirit of God, started to go, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In a prison, in darkness, that had never happened. And so the ground shook. Because for the first time, our planet was encountering the footsteps of God amongst men that had been filled with the Spirit of God. And that is why our world continues to change today because of people like you. Because we say not on our watch. We are not going to continue to live in a planet where cancer takes half of the population. One in two. Now, people get it. It's wrong. Something went wrong. Back in the 20s, that wasn't the case. One in 200 people got it. Now one in two. Something's wrong. We've got to figure that out. So we have to cry out to the Lord. We have to pray and say, Lord, why are so many people getting cancer? Yes, it'd be great if we could walk around healing everyone. But there's also wisdom. There's also knowledge. There's also understanding. I can't stand up here with a big giant bag of Dorito chips just going, I don't understand why the Lord won't heal me. Someone will come by and go, well, I'd like to be Jesus to you. Could I borrow your bag of chips? And, right? right? Yeah. Let's not be silly. Let's not just surround somebody while they're eating their chips and just start praying in tongues over them. Oh, shandala kiria toria. I just want to see someone go, oh, excuse me, pardon me. Can I just borrow those chips? Thanks. You guys go ahead, keep praying. Now, I believe in praying. I'm teaching you to pray all the time, but sometimes the praying and abiding with the Spirit of God is for you to get the wisdom to start doing smart things instead of dumb things. Because sometimes we're self-medicating through food or we're self-medicating through drinking or we're self-medicating through a million things that we do. That the Lord's like, it's not about a magic wand going, ha-da-da-da, shazam, and you're all better. Sometimes it's about, here's the Spirit of wisdom, here's the Spirit of knowledge, here's the Spirit of understanding but you're going to get that by abiding in my spirit. But the first thing we need to do is we need to eliminate our fear of the end and stop worrying about the end and realize that is in the past. The future is supposed to be glorious. 
instead of thinking, well, Jesus will deal with the cancer when he gets back. He's a bit late, but when he gets back, I'm sure he'll fix cancer. No, we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. It is our job to fix it. It is our job to fix world hunger. It is our job to fix human trafficking. It is our job to fix injustice in the world. That is what righteousness does. That is what the kingdom does, is to bring peace and joy and rightness in the world. We are the ones to do it. We are the soldiers of Christ. We are the royal priesthood that says, not on our watch, not in our land, no longer, it's not happening. And let me tell you something, there's a reason that God is moving through the media and he's moving through Twitter and he's moving through Facebook and he's moving through hashtag me too because the church isn't doing it. So God will find somebody he will. And he's using the downtrodden and the set aside and the victims to say, hey, here's a great idea, you guys. How about you start saying me too? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens if we get five of you going me too and 10 of you going, me too. I mean, maybe it'll take down Hollywood. Maybe it'll take down some pretty horrific things that are happening in the world. You know, just start saying, me too. You don't think that was a Jesus idea? You don't think God dropped that idea in someone's head? Because that's kingdom. That's what the Spirit of God is like. So let me end with this. I want every time you come here to come and say, Lord, doesn't matter what happened my week, Maybe I buried my head in the sand. I didn't confront someone I needed to in love. I've been walked over again. I was full of anxiety. I drank eight bottles of wine this week. I don't care how you, what you did. Show up. Maybe show up with your bottle of wine. I don't know, whatever you need to do. But show up and say, but Jesus, here I am. And I want to get free from this crap in my life. And I want to be delivered. And I want to be restored. And I want you to save me in my situation. And you know what? He's going to. And he will, and that's a promise. But just keep coming and keep eating. Keep eating this good food. Keep eating the richness of grace. Keep eating that you are loved. And his only banner over you is not guilt. It's not look what you did. It's not how you failed. It's not you messed up. His only banner over you is love. Oh, I love that guy. I love him. God looks over and goes, oh, I just, I just love Dan. I love Joe. Love him. I love Eric, love Dave, love Barry. That's my best guy, that Barry guy. Love him, salt of the earth guy. Right? He's out there boating or fishing. I don't know, he just loves doing stuff. I love it. And I put that in him, right? God has hardwired you in things that he loves. Every one of you is a part expression of God because he's infinite and it takes all of us to express who he is. And so he's cheering you on to get better. He's cheering you on to get healthy. Not so he goes, good, obey me. I feel better about myself now. I don't, if you're serving that God, quit, become an atheist because that God's a narcissist and he's not worthy of your worship. The God that's worthy of your worship is the God goes, yeah, I, yeah, it's okay, it's not about me. I don't really need your glory. I'm good. I'm awesome. And I know I am. We've got to make you awesome. That's what we've got to do. Amen? Amen? Amen. Be blessed. Have a good week.